you came in to this sanctuary with or the baggage or whatever is, has been the, the account of your week. Our wealth is in the cross because in light of eternity, nothing else matters, right? This is, this is something we need to get, that the important part of you isn't the, the body you're, you're sitting in here with. There's an important part of you that will carry on after that body is like well under the ground, right? And what determines how that lives on is, is what you make of Christ and if your wealth is in the cross. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, but let's play this next clip here. The National Weather Service in Chicago has issued a tornado warning for this isn't live. northwestern DeKalb this County in north central Illinois, southwestern Boone County in north central Illinois, southeastern Ogle County in north central Illinois, southeastern Winnebago County in north central Illinois until 7.45 p.m. At 6.57 p.m., a confirmed large and extremely dangerous tornado was located near Hillcrest or just northwest of Rochelle and moving northeast at 45 miles per hour. This is a particularly dangerous situation. Hazard, damaging tornado. Source, radar confirmed tornado. Impact, you are in a life-threatening situation. Flying debris may be deadly to those caught without shelter. Mobile homes will be destroyed. Considerable damage to homes, businesses, and vehicles is likely, and complete destruction is possible. Well, that's an uplifting message. I'm just kidding. How many of you have heard one of those before? I know some, anybody heard one of those before, seen one of those on TV? Okay, like I just, I, when I was preparing for this message, I realized something that the, uh, the generation of the interrupting TV, like tornado warning, is slowly becoming not a thing anymore. Um, but whenever I hear that, it's got this distinctive voice on there, that distinctive, weird, annoying buzzer, right? The hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Anybody else with me? Anybody else through a tornado at one point in their time? Okay, yeah, yeah. So this is... Uh, I want to tell you a story. One April evening, a young family living in rural western Illinois heard a very similar warning, saw a very similar warning on their TV. And anybody, if you've ever been in uh, western Illinois, it is flat as a pancake, a cornfields for miles. It's a big you know, tornado. Part of that tornado thing is, is like, it's just a reality of life. They happen there. You know, lots of flat land, lots of, and this family heard the warning gathered the kids and did what they knew they needed to do. They needed to get to shelter and they needed to get there now. And so they gathered the kids. Mom and dad got the kids, got them in a safe position. Once they got everybody, everybody situated, the mom's stomach sank because the mom realized that she was missing one of her kids. Her youngest kid wasn't, wasn't with them. Mom's Stomach sank because they had heard the warning. They were able to get to shelter. Terror swept over her as she realized her youngest son was there. Tornado warning is like it's a signal, right? It points to a coming reality. It comes to a point. It, co- it points to a coming potential reality, a potentially life-altering reality. If you've ever lived through a tornado or know someone that has, it changes people's lives in not very good ways usually. And so for those that heard the warning, they were able to get to shelter and to buckle down for safety, but there was someone who didn't hear that warning and wasn't able to get to safety. So while most of the family heard the warning, the youngest son was actually a few doors down the neighborhood playing video games with a friend on the second story of their home. Unplugged from the world, unplugged from news, not able to hear the warning. I want you to pause and think about what is happening here. There's a warning Someone sent the warning out. There's a tornado coming. Get the shelter. But someone didn't hear that warning and was not able to get the shelter. Those who responded to it were able to get to safely safety. And the one who didn't hear it was in a very perilous situation. You guys realize this, right? Luckily for that kid, at some point during his gaming with, the, with his friend, he paused to look out the window. And he was, as he looked at the sky... In that next slide, they saw the very ominous sky 
and knew he had to, something wasn't right. You see a sky like that, guys? That's bad news, okay? He knew something wasn't right, and he needed to get home immediately. So the kid immediately dropped the controller, ran down the stairs, ran out the door, and started to run home. And as I approached the front door of my house, to this day I can hear the screams of my mom calling out my name. She grabbed me up and immediately took me inside to the place where everyone was hunkered down for safety. This was a story from my childhood, and it was a very real story, a very terrifying story. Um, Don't bog yourself down with the details. I think I was seven or eight at the time, so not the smartest tool in the shed or sharpest tool in the shed. I was playing Nintendo with my friend Nathan. I was about, I don't know, a block away, and we lived in this really, really small Illinois town about uh, 10, 15 miles east of the Mississippi, and as you looked west, this is what you saw, just flat cornfields. And we were playing Nintendo, probably some Contra. I don't know. That was my favorite game back then. Um, And when I looked out at the sky, I saw what was coming. I wasn't around to hear the warning like the rest of my family was. But for my, luckily for my sake, I was able to see that. And that's exactly what I did. No, literally, I I dropped the controller. I ran down the stairs. I started to run home. Again, not the smartest thing to do when you got this thing coming at you. But my mom's... I mean, to this day, it makes the hairs in the back of my neck stand. David, where were you? I have the tears running down my eyes, and and she grabs me up and takes me inside to safety. With any tornado warning that you see in the news, there's someone behind a desk somewhere that pushes that button that says, okay, it's go time. We got to get the word out about this. This is coming. This can change people's lives forever. We need to warn them about it and get them to safety. And in all of our gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we read about this guy named John the Baptist who is like the guy that pushes the button, that sends out the warning. His number one mission was to get the word out, to prepare the way for the Lord, to let everyone know that the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world was here and everything Everything was about to change. We're going to hear about John in a little bit, but I want you to remember this. Just like the people in that message, the people in my family heard that message, were able to get to safety, those who responded to his message, John was like that person getting that message out so that people could respond to the message of the cross of Jesus Christ, to the message that the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world was here and everything was about to be different. At this time, Matthew Weaver is going to come forward and read for us today. Matthew, Matthew, I'm sorry, John, chapter 1, verses 29 through 42. Would you please stand out of respect for the reading of God's word? This is something that our church does because what God, you're about to hear the audible voice of God, right? And that is important. What I'm about to do is just give commentary on that. So, Matthew, please lead us in reading of the text. So we're reading from John 1, 29 to 42. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I met when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself do not know him. But the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man in whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. The next day, John was there again, and with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and spent that day with them. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew, 
Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard that John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. Thank you. This is God's word. You may receive it. Thank you. Hopefully when you came in, you received a bulletin. And in there, there's some sermon notes we'd love for you to kind of track with us as we go through the text and point out some things. My guess is is that we don't fully appreciate the magnitude of what is actually happening in this very short account from John. When John says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, there is some big things happening in that very, very short phrase. And so I want to draw your attention to those things this morning. Major things, life-altering things. So I think the question to be answered today is this. What does this account reveal about Jesus, and why does it matter? What is John trying to get across? What is John trying to get us to understand? What is John trying to get his readers to understand? What does John the Baptist mean? What's implied in all of this? I think the answer is this. That this account reveals who Jesus is, where he's from, why he came, and for whom he came. It matters Because if Jesus is worth following, understanding his validity and mission matters. How many of you in here would ask your mechanic to represent you in court? Not a hand should have gone. Thankful, no hand. How many of you would ask your lawyer to fix your transmission? No. You want those people to have credentials. You want those people to know what they're doing. Be prepared, be adequate to to do what you're asking them to do. And I think understanding Jesus' validity, understanding his credentials, why he is who he said he is, what he came to do, all of that stuff matters. All of that stuff matters. And I think John here reveals some things that we need to consider. If you consider yourself a Christian, if you want to follow Jesus as his disciple, you got to understand some of these credentials. And we're not going to go, we're not going to spend a lot of time on apologetic stuff today, but I do want to give you a a resource later that you can check out. But the reality of who Jesus is and why John's pointing to him matters is because it forever changes the people that come in contact with that message. Many of you in this room maybe have been forever changed by the message of Jesus, by the gospel. But it's important to understand. Albert Einstein never expressed belief in a personal God, but Um, on October 26, 1929, he was interviewed in the Saturday Evening Post asking about various things. And and, uh, he got to the point in the interview where where the interviewer asked him about Jesus, what he thought about Jesus. This is what he says. This is following up. He says, Emil Ludwig's Jesus, Einstein replied, is shallow. Jesus is too colossal for the pen of phrase mongers, however artful. No man can dispose of Christianity with a bon mot or a witty remark. You accept the historical Jesus? The interviewer asked. Unquestionably, no one can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates in every word. No myth is filled with such life. How different, for instance, is the impression we receive from the account of legendary heroes of antiquity like Theseus. Theseus and and other heroes of his type lack the authentic validity or vitality of Jesus. I can't tell you how many people I know that have been radically transformed by the message of Jesus, not because it's some arbitrary words on a page, but that Jesus was the Lamb of God who took away their sin, and they understand the implications of that. And it alters forever the trajectory of their lives. Our mission at the Hillsdale Free Methodist Church is to reveal Christ's love to all through the transforming power of God's Word. Because myself, many of our People we know, the word of God has a unique way to transform lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. I would encourage you just to give a plug to this inspiration tonight. You don't want to miss what happens after the 
society meeting and potluck in the gym. Because what happens is very interesting. Because we come into this room, we worship the Lord in song, but then we share with one another stories of how Christ, the Lamb of God, has transformed our hearts and lives. And I would encourage you to come tonight to check that out and to bring a testimony to share, to edify the body. So the word for the day is follow. The word for the day is follow. John is taking the message of Jesus Christ. He's pointing to the Lamb and he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and it is now the disciples who begin to follow Jesus. And we start to see that in this text. So what should we hone in on in this text in order to more fully follow Jesus? I think the first thing is that we need to understand who Jesus is. He is the Lamb. When John says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, when John says, the Lamb, there's all kinds of stuff popping up in these people. They knew exactly what lambs were for back then. Back then, lambs were not these cuddly pets we just sort of take to fairs and show. When John called Jesus the Lamb, it was a death sentence. Lambs died. That's what they did. They, they, they died. Maybe they got eaten, but they died. That was, that was their purpose. There were two lambs sacrificed in the temple every day, and then on the Day of Atonement, all kinds of lambs were sacrificed. We know this from history from, and from the account in the Scriptures. In Exodus 29, it describes the twice-daily sacrifice of the year-old lambs. And that lamb, that sacrificial lamb, atoned for, signified the atonement of the sins of the people throughout history. And in John's declaring that Jesus would be the lamb, that sacrifice, the lamb for the world, that sacrifice meant that Jesus was going to die for the sins of the world. Because earlier in John 1.1, 1, 1, we read that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, because God had come down in the flesh. Remember, we set up a tent here, which was kind of awkward, um, <laughs> But God came to tabernacle with us. We looked at that tent, how it alluded to the tabernacle in the wilderness. God, putting on flesh, became the perfect spotless lamb who would die for the sin of the world. When John says the lamb, it's a death sentence right from the start. Jesus was destined to die. John didn't present Jesus as simply some great moral teacher. It wasn't, behold the prophet. It wasn't, behold the cosmic therapist who will make you feel good about yourself. It was, behold the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. We see a foreshadowing of this sacrifice in Genesis 22. Way, 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 way back at the beginning, we knew this was going to happen. Abraham was given a command by God, take your son Isaac up Mount Moriah, where he's going to be a sacrifice. They get up the mountain, and, and Isaac says what? Where is, where's the lamb? And Abraham says what? God will provide the lamb. Abraham was fully prepared to follow through with it, but as you know, God stopped him at the last minute. And provided a ram for the, for the sacrifice. Jesus is foreshadowed in that text. Not only so, but in Exodus 12. Fast forward lots and lots of years. And the people of Israel are in Egypt. They're in slavery. And God says, get your people out of here. I'm going to send an angel who's going to kill a bunch of firstborns. Unless you put the blood of the lamb on your doorpost. And what happened? We call it Passover because the angel of the Lord came down. The death angel came down and started to kill firstborn children except for those whose blood was applied on the doorposts. The lamb. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, the apostle Paul talks about Jesus as being the Passover lamb. So all throughout the Old Testament, we have a foreshadowing of what is going to take place. We read about it earlier in Isaiah 53. Hundreds of years before Jesus even came, we knew that Jesus was going to be a sacrifice for the world. 
Romans 6.23 says that for the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is Christ, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And with the lamb sacrifice, when we put our trust in the lamb, in Jesus Christ, his blood is applied to the door frames of our hearts in such a way so that we will not taste eternal death. So who is Jesus? Jesus is that lamb. That lamb sent from, in, in, from the foundations of the world. The plan was for him to come and die for the world. That's you. That's me. That's those that are in this room right now. So who is Jesus? He's the lamb. Secondly, where is Jesus from? Jesus was from God. So not only is Jesus the lamb, but he is the lamb of God. And as we talked about earlier, John 1, he was also God. And because of this, because he was from God and because he is God, all the fullness of deity was in him. We read that a couple of weeks ago. Because of that, he alone qualifies to be the lamb that can take away all the sins of the world. When we look at the Old Testament, twice daily lambs were sacrificed. And that kept going, that kept going, that kept going. Because nothing was completely covered. It could never cover it all. But because God himself came down, put on flesh for our place to, to live the life we couldn't live and die the death that we deserve to die, his sacrifice can be applied to us. And because that is God, his perfect sacrifice can cover over anything that you've ever done in your life. So who is Jesus? The lamb. Where is he from? He's from God. And that's important to remember. What were Jesus' qualifications though? Well, short answer, apart from John's testimony and the testimony of the gospel writers, just simply Jesus, we can see in the gospel that Jesus performed miracles, changed lives, brought back people from the dead. Oh, and uh, he did himself rise again, like the only person in history to do it. <laughs> By his own power, right? But if that's something you're interested in, if you're interested in studying the credentials of Jesus and why we know he was the Lamb of God, the, 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 the Christ, as we read about in the text, the, the anointed one, um, if you check out the, the sermon notes for this message on our website, on there is a list of 60, actually 60 plus Old Testament prophecies that said this was what was going to happen. And it talks about it in the Old Testament, and you can look them up in the New Testament. And look, hundreds of years before Christ, this is why he was going to come. So Jesus is the Lamb of God, and three, his primary mission, to take away sin. I want to park here a little bit, just a little bit. Um, I'm a pastor, and I, uh, I spend a lot of time reading, doing research, and, and um, just trying to be really faithful about, you know, when, when we bring stuff, I mean, the, in our church, we really value this time where we, we take seriously the Word of God and, and exegeting it appropriately and all that stuff. In, in some of the research that I've been doing lately, even for this message, one of the things that keeps creeping up in... Um, And it's kind of made its way into church culture, and you need to realize this. The idea of Jesus' primary objective to be the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world is kind of becoming a secondary thing in a lot of church and a lot of Christian circles. Um, people question the nature of the atonement. They try to say that Jesus really came to be a good teacher, that the whole sin thing is kind of secondary, that Jesus really came to make us feel good about ourselves, help us to achieve great things and all kinds of wealth and all this stuff. And that's why Jesus came. And, the, you know, he did come to save sins, but, no, no, Jesus wants to give you your best life. And I would just pause to say that um, that's not something that is ever revealed in Scripture as being Jesus' primary mission or objective. First of all, Jesus came to save sinners, <laughs> of which I'm the worst. But when Jesus saves us from sin, when we realize what that means, when we, what we, when we realize what that exchange entails, we start to live lives 
that affect the world. But the primary objective was for Jesus to come to be the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. So not only was Jesus the Lamb of God, he came to take away the sin of the world. And in in this phrase, we see the culmination of the why. The culmination of the why, to take away the sin. And this is important. Because herein lies the good news. You are a lot worse than you think you are. We've heard that one before, haven't we? But it's true. You're a lot worse than you think you are. I'm a lot worse than I think I am. But the good news is this. Because that lamb came down, we, our relationship with God can be restored. It's great news. That was his primary mission, to take away sin. Whose sin? Number four, the world's. In verse 29. Later on, John would end up writing 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And in 1st John 2.2, 2, the John that writes this, not John the Baptist. There's a lot of Johns in the Bible. <laughs> John the Apostle would write this in John 2.2. 2, he, talking of Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only ours, but also for the sins of the world. And just a little bit longer later after that, he would also write this in chapter 4, verse 9, that this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. That is great news. Because not only are our sins taken away when we put our trust in Jesus, or as when we saw in in chapter 1 when we received that message, we become children of God and we can now actually live. We don't have to settle for what this life says is life because what this world says is life is not life at all. It is only in Christ that we can begin to live because like I said way early ago, you are a soul. You have a body. The important part of you does not stop (laughs) when this flesh ends. The important part of you lives on. And so in him... In Christ, we can be adopted as his children so that we might live through Jesus. And it is only by faith that you can receive that message and have your sins forgiven. You are now a beacon. If you have responded to that message, some of you were here a couple weeks ago when I blinded everybody with that big old mirror that was up here. I'm sorry about that, by the way. (laughs) But just like John the Baptist now, if you have responded to that message, you are now called to be like John the Baptist. Look what happens, and even Andrew, look what happens earlier in this text, if you're, or later on in this text, if you grab your Bibles and open them up with, you still have your Bibles open. Going to verse 35, the next day John was there again, he tells, look, the Lamb of God, and then there were disciples. What did they do? They, they, they heard the message and they followed Jesus, they said, Rabbi, where are you staying? They started to follow him. And later on we read that Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, what did he do? Was one of the two, heard that John had said, or uh, one of the two who heard what John said and had followed Jesus. And this is what he says. Verse 41, this is important. The first thing Andrew does, what does he do? He goes and finds his brother Simon. And he says what? He found the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, the one the prophets had foretold about, the one that was predicted. All these, we found him. And they bring him to Jesus. So John writes, Jesus, behold, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John is like this beacon that says, this is the message that changes everything. Listen to this guy. And the disciples start to follow him. And now if you've responded to that message, I believe that you and I have a a very important role to play in this. Because now it's up to us to tell others. To tell others this, the truth of this message, the good news of this message. A little over a year ago, uh, my family and I went on vacation. And we went to Tennessee I love, anybody from Tennessee? We got a lot of college students here and some, maybe, I don't know. 
Anybody ever been to Tennessee? Yes. Beautiful. If you've never been to Tennessee, you got to go there. It's amazing. Um, I'm a big outdoor nut, and so we love going to, to Smoky Mountain National Park, chasing waterfalls, hiking, all that stuff. We got this killer deal on a cabin in, uh, in a real small town in Tennessee. It was a, a ministry, and so they gave us a really good deal on it. We, we go. We'd never been there, um, but we, it's a good deal, so we're going to go, <laughs> right? So we go there, and, and as we get to this place we're staying, we notice something. Our cabin is like halfway up this mountain. <laughs> and I, first of all, if you've ever been to sort of the back areas of Tennessee, the roads kind of go like this, right? Whenever I come up to those roads, I just kind of imagine I'm that dude in that, uh, that, that Alexis commercial. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, they would put the pedal down and we get going and Angie's yelling at me, <laughs> holding on for dear life. We get to the base of this mountain. We look up, our cabin's up here. Angie's driving the car, and it's getting, so we start to get, it gets steep. And we could tell our car's kind of like, everybody's experienced that. You drive up the side of a hill. And I'm like, got it, baby. <laughs> get her up there. So we got it. We, there's no switchbacks. We get up there. We get to our cabin. Settle in. It's awesome. Beautiful cabin. Love it. But then we got to go sightseeing every day. We go sightseeing. We leave the cabin at least twice a day. We go sightseeing. We go hiking, waterfalls, so, so, so all of a sudden we got to leave and it's like, okay, we got to go down the hill, down the hill, ride the brakes, ride the brakes, ride the brakes. We come back, right up the hill and I loved it. It was great. It was so much fun. <laughs> I love that stuff. It drives her nuts <laughs> when I drive down those roads. But doing this every single day, we did little that we know it started to take a toll on our car. And if you know us, we buy old cars. Like our cars have like, you know, 150 plus, 200,000 plus miles on them. Yeah. And we didn't know this. It was taking a toll on our car. Vacation ends. Vacation ends. And we start coming home, driving up I-75. We're in the middle of nowhere, Kentucky. And all of a sudden, this little beacon on my dashboard lights up. One that, to this day, scares the spit out of me when I see it. But usually, I just ignore them. Um, <laughs> it's a check engine light. I didn't realize this. And again, normally I just ignore the check engine light on my car. Don't ever do that. Don't listen to me in that regard. But um, because, you know, I'm a guy and I just, you know, I just ignore things sometimes. <laughs> this time it was different though because we're driving down the road. And all of a sudden the check engine light comes on. A little while later we uh, start to smell something funny coming out the, the vents. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of an interesting smell. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Was it too much longer down the road, like steam started to come up out of the hood? And I'm like, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. The car literally just shuts off. And I am on a highway, like a freeway. We're driving home. car literally just starts to shut off. I'm like, I better get over. I pull over. Um, this is a picture of us. <laughs> it's the middle of nowhere, Kentucky. We had to get our car towed. Get it fixed the day of. Found out that all of this stuff on our vacation, all the up and down, up and down, up and down, heartbreaking transmission, yada, yada, yada. Uh, our water pump blew out. But the point of the story is that the water pump blew out. It's just a check engine lights are a signal that points to a coming reality. <laughs> Whether you like it or not. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, a, I'm not like an old guy. I'm, just, you know, I'm kind of 30 or whatever, but... Um, I'm getting to the point in my life where I remember when I was a kid hearing this commercial from a mechanic, and he said, you can pay me now, or you can pay me later. Some of you heard that one. Check engine lights are a beacon telling you that there is a coming reality, that you need to start doing a little course correction in light of. John the Baptist is kind of like this check engine light, if you will, although his message is a lot better. (laughs) But John is like that check engine light saying, you know what, guys, something's coming. You better get prepared because something is about to change. When he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John is acting like this beacon saying, you know what, get ready. Something is about to change. And that change is that the world's sin would finally be atoned for. 
that those who by faith put their trust in Jesus Christ would have his lamb, his blood, the blood of the lamb applied to the doorposts of their hearts and would no longer have to fear death. So in conclusion, what does following the lamb imply in light of this text? I believe, A, it requires that we trust, that we trust the lamb or that you trust the lamb as your lamb. Here's where things get a little personal because not only are we reading the text and, and trying to see what it means, but now we're, we're looking at the text and saying, okay, what, is, what does this mean for me? What, what, what do I need to do with this? And I believe it's this, that you need to trust, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, you need to trust him to take away your sin. Because you can't do it. You are not qualified to do anything with your own sin. Only Jesus is. Trust Jesus. Some people are hell-bent, literally, on trying to earn everything. We live in a culture that ruggedly promotes this idea that you, can, you, should, you should buckle down, pull your bootstraps up and knuckle down and get things done because you got to earn your keep. If you're going to get anywhere, you're, you're going to earn that. Now that may be true in a lot of things. It is not true with your sin because your sin is cosmic treason against the God of the universe and ain't nobody good enough to deal with that on their own. So receiving that, as we heard that message in, verse, in chapter 1, verse 12, whoever received the message, he gave the right to be called children of God. It requires that we take Jesus at his word when he says, when he promises to take away our sin. On Friday nights, I'm involved in a, uh, a life group here that meets down the hallway called Free for Life. This this past one, uh, someone said something that really hit me, and I began to think about it. What does it really mean to, to trust Jesus as, as your lamb? It means, and, and I believe it's this, that when we trust Jesus to take away our sin, when Jesus takes away our sin, the old is gone, the new has come, and things start to change in us. Our old past, our old reality, our old person is, is, is not a thing anymore. Because in Christ, all things are new, and he says this. He said, "My friend Corey he said the old man is dead. I'm just trying to keep him that way." And I thought, "Yes, that is much of the Christian life is following Jesus and making sure that old Dave BC or Dave before Christ stays dead, because I trust." And there's implications in the fact that Jesus takes away my sin. If we want to experience the fullness of life in Christ, it takes effort to keep that old self dead. So I think that you have to trust the lamb as your lamb. I think also that, B, you have to exchange your bubble for his kingdom. Let's park here a bit, church. Remember, I talked a little bit about we living in sort of this uh, performance-based society and culture. Um, Another thing we sort of live with and have to trudge through as Americans is this sort of like rugged individualisticism. And one of the problems with this is that our culture has increasingly become isolated. We self-isolate or we isolate ourselves in front of our phones. I always find it funny when I go on a date with my wife and sitting across from us is a couple just going like this. And then my phone's sitting there too. And I'm tempted to do this every time I get a text to see, well, what's going on? Because we have these bubbles that we've sort of formed around ourselves. And it's not just because of cell phones or anything like that, but it's, it's a part of it. But at the same time, like, we like the things we like. We like it our way. We want everything done our way. We want everything to kind of bend to our whims and, and, and mold into what we want and what we expect. We put our expectations on others and think, yeah, because that's what I want. That's the way it's got to be. And I think... If we are to truly follow Jesus like these disciples did, they dropped everything to follow Jesus. And we have to exchange our bubble for his kingdom. Someone living in a bubble might say something like, I'm not getting anything out of this. Whereas someone in the kingdom might say, I'm going to give my all to this. Someone 
in a bubble might make the excuse of, I don't have time for. Someone with a kingdom vision shifts their priorities to say, maybe this is more important than. Someone in a bubble will make the excuse of, I'm not qualified for. Whereas someone in the kingdom might say, Jesus might just be preparing me for. Someone in a bubble might say, I don't like the way that. Whereas someone in the kingdom might say, I can lovingly set aside my preference for this. Someone in a bubble might say, I wish someone would. uh, Whereas someone in the kingdom says, maybe I should. My daughter used to have uh, some rats. And uh, if you've ever had rats, they are amazing pets. Although my mother-in-law is here and she would disagree with me. Um, I loved the rats. Uh, they were so much fun to play with. Just sweet, sweet things. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to hear about this later. Um, <laughs> my daughter having rats, we used to have this ball, this, this uh, plastic ball. If you've had gerbils, hamsters, stuff like that, you, it's awesome. You stick the animal in there, you close the thing up, and you let it go. And what does it do? It kind of runs around the house. It's like, whee! and it runs around and it bumps into something and then it falls down the stairs. (laughs) But when you put the the animal in that bubble, in that cage or whatever you call it and it starts to run around, you kind of like get the sense that, man, they really think they're free, don't they? Right? Oh, I get to go all the places. Um, Here's, I think the Christian life sometimes, it's tempting the Christian life to become kind of like that, where we get in these bubbles and we think we got all kinds of freedom. Well, really, we're just running our house, bumping into things, and we're still in that ball. When we don't see the bigger picture of what Jesus does when he takes away sin, it's very easy to get stuck in that ball <laughs> where we think where freedom is actually an illusion because we're just bumping into things. So in Kierkegaard, wrote this in Training Christianity. Um, It's not in your sermon notes, but it's on mine, so I'm going to read it. (laughs) He writes this. He says, It is well known that Christ consistently used the expression follower. He never asks for admirers, worshipers, or adherents. No, he calls disciples. It is not adherents of a teaching, but followers of a life Christ is looking for. Notice in the text... We read it again earlier, that when it came to to verse 40, verse 39, they left what they had and followed Jesus, and then Andrew brought his brother, and he too, we know, followed Jesus. So, what does following the lamb require? Imply, trust the lamb. Exchange your bubble for his kingdom. And I think the the last thing that we need to consider is is the bringing others part that we see in this text. Simon, Andrew brings his brother Simon, and then what happens? Jesus looks at Simon and says, you know what? You get a new name, not because there's anything in you, but there is something in you that I'm going to make that is going to become a rock. Because Simon, Peter, Cephas, means rock bringing others, just like Andrew brought Simon Peter. Just like Andrew brought Simon Peter. Everyone who is in Christ is called to have skin in this game. Because in Matthew 28, Jesus says to his disciples, what does he tell them to do? Go, therefore, and make disciples. Now, churches come up with mission statements and vision statements, all this stuff. But the mission itself hasn't changed in 2,000 years. Our mission as a church is to make disciples. Disciples and everybody who considers himself a follower of Jesus, who is a disciple of Jesus, has some skin in that game. Just like John, we are now called to be beacons, things that point people to Jesus through our lives, through our actions, through our words. That is great news. Roger Fredrickson, in in one of the commentaries I read uh, in preparation for this message, says this. He says, And he brought him to Jesus. He, uh, meaning Andrew, brings his brother Simon to Jesus. And he says, isn't this the heart of all our evangelistic efforts? Jesus looked at Simon, 
searchingly, penetratingly, and saw what no one else could see. He saw not only what Peter could become, but who he would become. That's huge. Because in you, if you are a Christian, Christ has already done that for each and every one of you. He has seen something in you that you could become and that he will make you become. Not because it's going to restrict your freedom, but because it will bring life in a way you will never experience life outside of Christ. My worship point is this. The son of God is the lamb of God who came to reconcile the world to God. And Jesus is worthy of our worship because he is God and gave himself for us. None of your friends has given their life for you. Jesus has. None of your friends has lived a perfect life. Jesus has. None of your friends has risen from the dead. But Jesus has. And that changes everything. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That message changes everything. Everything. When, when my wife and I got married, boy, it was almost 20 years ago, 19 years ago. Um, we were all convinced we're going to wait five years before we have kids. I'm gonna, <laughs> anybody say that? Anybody else say that? We're going to wait X amount of years before we have kids. And uh, we ended up waiting three. <laughs> Didn't know what was going to happen. But I think it was some, some evening in June, uh, Angie realizes that something wasn't uh, happening that should be happening. <laughs> and she's like, I think I need to go check this out. Um, and I remember getting that test back and seeing that extra line on there. Or was it a plus? I don't remember. But, and thinking, oh, my world. Oh, my, oh my world. Oh, my word. <laughs> my world is about to be rocked. <laughs> and nine months later, we had our first daughter, Elizabeth. That message really changed my life because now I had to reorient some things in my life. I had to reorient my priorities. I had to realize that, man, I got to, there, there's some things that I need to bring to this because uh, she's not having this alone. John the Baptist's message, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world is a life-changing reality to those who receive that message, to those who believe in Jesus and trust him. As their lamb. My gospel application is this. Following Jesus means we recognize our need of him and put our trust in him. In Jesus, our life can become something far greater than what we settle for without him. Without Jesus, you are merely settling. You will never have fullness of life like you can when you're in Christ. That is great news. That is great news. That is life-changing, life-altering, eternity-altering news.